SoftBank is planning for the singularity. Everyone is chilling somewhere else besides Netflix and everything you need to know to Pokemon Go with your kids. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1557, recorded Monday, July 18th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to more than 100 job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And by Igloo Software. Igloo is an internet you'll actually like. It connects people with the information they need to do their best work. Try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. And by Trunk Club. Get clothes that fit and look amazing without ever stepping into a store again. Trunk Club will help you create the wardrobe you've always dreamed of with your own personal stylist. Go to trunklove.com slash TNT and join Trunk Club today. Hello, welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we tell you all the technology news that you need to know right now, today. I am Megan Maroney. Jason Howell is out this week, but joining me today is Georgia Dow from iMore. Welcome, Georgia. Hey, Megan. How are you doing? <laughs> I am doing great. How are you? I'm doing really well, thank you. So we had some conversations uh, over the weekend about Pokemon Go, which um, I don't know if people are tired of talking about it or not. I am not tired of talking about it. We're going to talk about it later in the show. We have some Apple news, some Microsoft news. So why don't we get started? <laughs> Japanese company SoftBank has purchased chip design firm Arm Holdings for $32 billion. Shares of Arms were up, while shares of Sprint, which is owned by SoftBank, were down due to the massive amount of cash the company is laying out for Arm. The Financial Times reports that SoftBank founder Ma Masayoshi Son isn't worried and is calmly planning for a world where mobile phone sales have stalled. He's gazing off into the distance of the Internet of Things as well as looking into the singularity where machine intelligence becomes smarter, where machine intelligence becomes smarter than human intelligent intelligence. Uh, he might already be right with me. Do you think he's right, Georgia? <laughs> I think that, you know, sometimes you have to play for the long game and really wait. And so not every single purchase is going to make money or make money right away. I think that the unfortunate thing with stocks is that, you know, you sneeze, suddenly your stock goes up and down, but you have to think about the future and where they're at. So I can understand the purchase to that. And I think that, you know, he's probably going to end up OK in the future either way. Yeah, ARM, of course, doesn't make chips. They just design them. Uh, so it, it is it is interesting that um, that, that is the big buy here. Uh, it's also the biggest European technology acquisition ever attempted and the biggest cross-border deal since Brexit, which I guess I'm not sure if that's good news or bad news. I think ARM uh, got a, a pretty good, or SoftBank got a good deal on them because of Brexit. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, unfortunately, because of that, there's a lot of things that are going to be really cheap when you're dealing with, um, you know, the UK. So I think that you're, there's going to be a lot of big purchases that are going to be happening because if you're planning to make a purchase, now would be the time to be able to do it. You're going to just deal with, you know, when other people are dealing with recessions or prices go down, that's when your buying power goes up. And so you're going to be able to buy things for what maybe not to us would seem like a bargain, but for them would. And so it's a smart time to make big purchases. Well, in other news today, drug company GlaxoSmithKline announced a partnership with Apple to use Research Kit to facilitate a study on rheumatoid arthritis. This marks the first big company to use Apple's app announced last March. Universities and independent researchers are already using Research Kit with patients who have asthma, diabetes, breast cancer, autism, epilepsy, and other conditions. Uh, this is an important test to see if drug companies can get worthwhile data. I know you are really interested in research kit. Uh, you're in the medical profession. Uh, what do you think about getting data uh, from the iPhone? Uh, do you think that uh, it makes a difference that, I mean, you have to have an iPhone in order to get this data? Do you think that research will be skewed because of this? It definitely will be skewed. 
because there's only a certain amount of people that can afford to get an iPhone. And so you're going to be dealing with a certain, like if you look at Apple's data, they are people that are doing better off. They're at a certain economic level. They're usually a little bit more health conscious. There's certain things that are going to skew the data to that. Um, also, you're not going to be getting data from certain parts, other parts of the world. So when you're really doing research that you want to be great, you want to have a nice cross section of cultures, of ages, of economic status. That being said, one of the most the greatest difficulties in dealing with research is that to find people to want to do the research with you. And that's really hard. And so often when you're working in a university, you're, you know, giving people five dollars or free pizza or a donut like you're having to incentivize because no one really wants to be part of research for nothing because you don't usually get paid very much to be able to do it. And so it becomes really, really difficult to get a large enough field of people participating to make your research valid. Because if your numbers are really small, it really doesn't make any difference whatever data you get from that. And the wonderful thing is that this is really passive data. It's very easy. You already have your phone. You sign yourself up for it. And then you can give in information and it can be automatically sent off. So you don't have to worry about the paperwork. You don't have to worry about categorizing. Um, the other thing that's really nice is that you can print out data immediately. So usually when we deal with data, we put it in, you, you're there, you're trying to remember back, how did I feel yesterday or the week before, because it's very time sensitive. With having it on the iPhone, it's great. You can feel, you know, I feel really upset today. I can track it in. If you're using it with your watch, it can also track your heart rate that you're dealing with and your sleep sensors and all of the other things that you're going to be able to take. So I think that this is going to change the manner in which we do research because your phone's always with you. So you can do the research real time. It's not even journaling, which people often will journal, say that they did it the same day they journaled it, but it's like, you know, three weeks later or right before they have to send in the, the data to that. So I think that it's going to be really helpful to people. I think that it's going to increase participation, but I do think that the data will be slightly skewed and they'll have to take that into consideration. So do you use uh, iPhone apps in your therapy practice with patients uh, to get data back about moods and things like that? I have tried. I have not found that people have been very forthcoming with giving it. So often I make them uh, do very, very simple applications that they're going to be going. So just simply like mood. I think that anything that's very intensive, people don't do. So I still have people journal. I always have them journal. And for that, I don't like them using their technology. I actually like them using pen and paper. And then just to do something like a mood tracker or how to go through with a panic attack or to do tracking their breathing techniques. So um, app, the Apple Watch's new set breathe is going to be like changed, like completely life changing for me and my therapy practice, because the most difficult thing for people to do is to remember to practice your deep breathing techniques. And so the Apple Watch will be changing that in that it will remind you. And that's the biggest thing that people forget. So if you want to participate in this particular study, you can download the app now. Uh, it's free. I downloaded it and did a little walkthrough on iOS today. It basically asked me if I had rheumatoid arthritis, and I said no. So I did not uh, get to participate in the study, which I guess makes sense. Uh, but if you want to participate, I think they're looking for 300 people over three months. So it seems like a pretty uh, small number to get. Yeah, that's my only thing when I was looking through it is why would they have ask for such a small sample size? I think that you know, like they could get probably quite easily, you know, a thousand people, you know, when you just take a look at the stats of people that use it. And if even 1% of the people that have a rheumatoid arthritis and use the iPhone, it would be an easy to get a larger sample size. The larger the sample size, the better your data will be. But I guess they're trying it out and this is where they're starting and they're starting small and easy so that that will be successful. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like this is a test case to see if like the big pharmaceutical companies, um, if it's beneficial to them. So. Well, Microsoft announced the two terabyte slimmer, sleekier Xbox One S today. You can pre-order now for an August 2nd delivery. You can also pre-order a 500 gigabyte version for $299 and a one terabyte version for $349. But Microsoft has not released a date for those versions yet. Um, I don't think I mentioned the price of the first one, which I think is $400, $399. Um, let me check on that. Uh, but yeah, I think it's the most expensive Xbox to date. Will you four hundred dollars? You can have it on August second. What do you think, Georgia? <laughs> I don't know. Is this, am, am I the only one that doesn't like S version of devices? <laughs> I'm just. I don't know. Um, 
I'm I'm not going to be purchasing it. I'm going to wait till like again. Now I've kind of moved into the VR field. I'm probably not going to be updating for a while. It's I've already spent a lot of money on virtual reality systems. I think that it's it looks beautiful. It's sleek. It's faster. You know the the playback version and and the storage is lovely. But what really does it bring to the plate? I don't know. Are you going to be purchasing this? Are your kids excited? Uh, they're probably excited. We won't uh, be purchasing this. Um, we are, yeah, we've Is never... Is this the first moment that they're hearing about this? <laughs> it I'm might be. Sorry. It might be, yeah. You just, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, no, we're, we're, I mean, they're welcome to save their pennies and buy it, but they're more, you know, they're, they're just into Minecraft and YouTube at this point. Minecraft, YouTube, drones, and a little Pokemon Go. So I don't think that they've never had an Xbox, so I don't think that they'll, they'll miss this one. But I think you're right that it does seem like a lot of uh, people are really investing in VR and AR. Uh, and this, I mean, they'd have to make it, make it flashy. So yeah, it, it's, it's 40% smaller. It's the only console with 4K Ultra Blue HD Blu-ray and 4K video streaming, um, which is better than our Apple TVs. But yeah, I, um, I'm, not, I'm not a good judge, but it, I'm sure some people are excited about it. Just not. Yeah, it's, it's sleek looking. It looks nice. It'll take up less space. Um, and you'll be able to play more powerful games, which is great because if you're going to be playing, but I don't know, for its immersiveness, I think that it would still be lacking upon that. Probably. Well, I spotted an editorial over the weekend by Sarah Slobin. She's a journalist at Quartz. She writes that our ability to live stream disasters is not making the world a better place. On Friday, we reported on the show about the attempted coup in Turkey, and someone in the chat room pointed out Facebook live streams weren't journalism. They were video verite. Somebody else on Twitter said it was we were being very Pollyanna about it and not uh, really just, just being amazed that everyone that we could watch it, but there was no context uh, which is true. Uh, basically, we were just saying this is interesting and, and different, uh, but now it's up to us to see what we want to watch and not watch. It's not beneficial to everyone to watch every tragedy live, necessarily. Uh, you're a journalist, you're a psychotherapist. How do you suggest people approach this newfound ability to watch disaster as they happen from any of our devices? Yeah, I think that one of the wonderful things is that you can get information almost instantaneously. I think that people have to think about what they post on Facebook because one is it can like auto play. And so you're going to be seeing something that you may not wish to see. And there is a real negative effect that comes out from watching disasters and seeing horrible things happen. There's something that happens psychologically to us is that we become a little bit more fear-based. We become a little bit more frightened. We feel more dis-ease, greater chances of anxiety. And so you might think that, well, because this is important, I should have to see it. But I think that we need to be mindful of what can you handle seeing, what would be healthy for you to see. Because it, we used to live in a part of the world where if bad things happened across the world, we didn't know about it. And so in the 70s, we used to feel safer. We used to let kids do more because we didn't know about the bad things. Now, statistically, we were actually in a much more dangerous time of the world. There were many more bad things that happened statistically. Now we are much more and more frightened. We're much more coddled. We're much more careful with what our kids do and don't do because we now, if a disaster happens halfway across the globe, we hear about it. So if your feed on Twitter, on Facebook is constantly filled with, horrible things that are happening in the world, which it is important to be knowledgeable to that. But how much you absorb yourself into that is going to change who you are as a person and it's going to change how you parent. It's going to change how you interact with other people. And if you're dealing with depression, anxiety, have already been going through a hard time, you really want to keep yourself away from seeing these things, especially with other people using these titles for their own gain. Because when we become frightened or anxious, the part of our brain, the cognitive part of our brain, our thinking brain, actually turns off. So when you're really, really scared, if you've ever been exceptionally frightened, you're not going to make great decisions. If you're really traumatized, you're not making great decisions because the cognitive part of your brain turns off and you become a limbic brain, which is just really fast, get out of the way, run away, or fight. And so it increases aggressivity and lowers the, the chances of you making really great decisions. And I don't think that people really think about that because it happens so passively. We kind of just put it on because we want to be the first person to talk about a disaster. We want to be someone that's showing something. 
But it's okay to say, you know what, this is not something that would be healthy for me to see. And I think that a lot of people put out guilt, you like, you know, because this is something horrible seeing, everyone should have to see it. I think that we need to think that, you know, our own personal health is more important to that. And you need to know what will be very strongly affected to you. I know that a lot of people that I see that are dealing with anxiety, this is very traumatic for them and they have to be very careful with their, you know, social feeds. Exactly. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's okay to just read about things later, right? I mean, uh, because we don't have to watch things live to understand. I mean, that's the thing that I, I sometimes feel like I don't want to remain ignorant, especially, especially about international affairs or mm -hmm. just people that are unlike me that have different experiences. I, I want to understand them, but but I can, I can, there's plenty of opportunities to read what they're saying or to read, you know, serious journalism about it. I don't necessarily have to just watch the live streams where I don't know what I'm going to see next. Yes, and it can be really traumatic. So you see something you don't know what to expect that you're going to see. It can be very traumatic for you. I think that knowledge is one thing and that way to read about it or to deal with it when you're feeling you're in a better place and going to be able to really thoroughly understand what's happening in the world so you can make conscious and good decisions is one thing. But when people put up very traumatic events onto Facebook without a disclaimer to that, I think that a lot of people that may not know that they can't handle it see it. And I have an influx whenever there's been a national disaster of some sort of people coming into my office to see me because it has affected them very deeply to that. And for some people it won't be and they can go along with their lives and they're fine. And for other people it stays with them and continues to replay in their brain which is very traumatizing to them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, we, you know, you probably have been using the word trigger for a long time now. It's got sort of a negative connotation. It's this idea of people saying like, oh, don't show me that. It's trigger. Like, and, but, I mean, you, you have to be responsible as an adult. I mean, children are different. But as an adult, be responsible about what you think might tr trigger you and remove that from yourself. I mean, this, this, we're not mm -hmm. talking about keeping things off the Internet or stopping people from live streaming. It's just making a, a personal choice. Yes, yes. And when I say triggers, I mean, I, I don't mean it in, um, you know, a, a form of the word of like this upset me or this of offended me. I'm saying that everyone has different things depending on their past that will cause them huge spikes in aggressivity or anxiety. And so this is more of a psychological term, not one of, well, I'm offended by this. That would be com something completely different. You want to be conscious of what you choose to open up and what you choose to read and the way that you matter that you do it. Sometimes you're like, you know what, today I can't. And that's all right. I don't think that there should be any shame in that. You want to make sure that your health comes first. Well, after the break, Yahoo reported earnings today. Alex Wilhelm from Mattermark is here to tell us why we should care and also a little news on Netflix. But first, let's take a minute to thank ZipRecruiter, the sponsor of this episode. Now, we often talk about hiring practices in Silicon Valley, and so many times our conversations surround whether hiring managers, managers are doing everything they can to find the right person. That means casting a wide net far outside of your personal friend group. There's no magic bullet for incorporating diversity into the hiring process, but one thing is for sure, posting jobs in one place is not enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites and with ZipRecruiter, now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to more than 100 job boards, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. Just post once and watch your candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy to use interface. Search by skills, location, work experience, and more. ZipRecruiter's advanced matching technology delivers the most relevant candidates based on your criteria. ZipRecruiter offers optimized pages that look great on any screen. Add their unique mobile apply process for more visitors and applicants. Find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. No more juggling emails or calls to your office. You can add multiple users to your account. So find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 800,000 businesses and is trusted by hundreds of Fortune 500 companies. More than 125 million candidate applications have been delivered. So whether you're hiring now or you plan to hire in the near future, check out their blog for recruiting tips and hiring resources. Right now you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. Access millions of resumes on ZipRecruiter with thousands of new ones added daily. ZipRecruiter is the fastest way to hire great people. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT and we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of tech news today. Netflix and Yahoo announced earnings today. Whenever I need someone to explain the financial markets to us and keep us from falling asleep at the same time, we call in Alex Wilhelm from Mattermark. Welcome, Alex. Hey, hey, no promises on the sleep thing, though. This is Yahoo earnings, so we all might die. 
time we're done. So. Well, well, let's say Netflix is always why important. I'm here. <laughs> That's why the two of you, if it starts to get boring, you know, just do something to bring us out of it. But but Netflix, this is interesting. Uh, they've been doing well for as long as anyone can remember. I mean, they had some stumbles, of course. Uh, but Netflix missed its second quarter subscriber numbers. Uh, CEO Reed Hastings says, quote, we are growing, but not as fast as we would like to or have been. Any ideas why this is happening? Yeah, it seems to be that they had a problem with churn. So the CEO said they had very strong uh, gross additions, but higher churn led to lower overall and net subscriber rates. And to put that into context, they were expecting about half a million U.S. new net subscribers in Q2, and instead had about 160,000 additions, so about a third the same amount. And they also missed international expectations. And so for Netflix, it's a question of, is this churn a one-time event, or is this the new, new normal for them? And if it is a new normal, they have to cut their uh, future growth forecast by quite a lot. Now, do you think it's the grandfathered pricing? I mean, you know, those of us who've been Netflix subscribers forever, like our price didn't go up, but then we all got the email that said your, your price is about to go up, um, prepare to pay another dollar a month. Um, do you think that has anything to do with it? Yeah, so there's an article on Business Insider that said the CEO directly blamed the media and discussion in the media for this price hike for some of the churn because they dismissed other uh, potential issues that may have led to it. But people have to keep in mind that the price differential here on a dollar basis isn't that high, one or two bucks a month, but can be up to about 25% for some grandfathered accounts uh, in a ratio basis. So if you are very, very price sensitive, it may matter. Um, kind of hard to see how that's the case, but it apparently is. And so I, I don't really know if that process will lead to short-term churn problems for, say, one or two quarters until it's over, or it's more of a long-term issue. But yeah, I think that's probably the core issue at uh, play here. Well, one of the things about Netflix that we always talk about um, is that, you know, it's not like pitching a show to a regular network because, you know, you just have to have subscribers. Like nobody necessarily has to watch particular shows, you know, Master of None. Like it doesn't, they don't care how many people are watching that show or, you know, the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt or, or any of the, the shows on Netflix as long as subscribers are coming, then it's fine, which is great for creativity. I mean, do you think this is going to affect that? I mean, the you know, the, the great shows that Netflix has? Well, I think the great shows are their core strength because you can't get them other places legally uh, for the most part. But one data point to keep in mind as we kind of keep uh, original content in the spotlight is that their Q3 forecasts are also light compared to what the street estimated or expected. So Netflix is saying that even though this quarter was very weak, the next quarter won't live up to uh, kind of market expectations. And that could be one of two things. Again, the churn problem we discussed, or it could be uh, you know, declining consumer interest in these original programming shows that are both very costly and very profitable. But it may be that the aggregate total um, interest base among the public for those is smaller than expected. Uh, I think the real canary in that particular coal mine will be US net subscriber growth over the next year. And if they've already reached a saturation point here at home, it'll tell us where or how far they can go abroad. But I don't see how they grow without that content. So to me, it's kind of a necessary but not sufficient um, quality for them to keep growing. Uh, in the chat room, someone's pointing out that I said it was going up a dollar a month. I think it's probably, it was seven ninety nine, and now it's at 11 I'm it's, not it's, really sure. It's 99 so that's why it's 25% because okay. two out of eight and four is 25 Okay, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, I don't know exactly how much I pay for, for Netflix, but it's totally worth it, whatever it is. <laughs> Got to get my Kimmy Schmidt. Uh, so what about Yahoo? What, what did we learn today? Uh, well, mostly that Yahoo is kind of exactly where you thought it was going to be. Uh, if you don't take into account a change in their accounting, the company shrunk by about 15% year over year. Uh, it bragged a lot about its declined share, uh, sorry, headcount and uh, cost base, and wrote down a whole bunch more of Tumblr goodwill. So let's see, it's getting smaller uh, in terms of both revenue and people, and um, its biggest purchase is not doing so well. So if you were hoping for a big Yahoo turnaround, it didn't happen. So we were supposed to hear about maybe a sale today. That was the rumor. Like the day, today was the deadline, uh, but we still haven't heard. Have you any of your sources point to when we will hear about a sale of their core internet business? I haven't heard anything that hasn't been reported. So if people want to tell me things, I'm on Twitter. <laughs> Say hi. Uh, but I have no dramatic insight there other than what Marissa Mayer said, the CEO, which was positive comments that the process was moving along. But given that people are still very uncertain about the overall value of the core Yahoo business and it hasn't leaked out too far, I don't think we've seen bids come in that are as specific and direct as you would hope to see right before the sale. So I wouldn't say we're going to see this you know, tonight or tomorrow morning, but hopefully in the next quarter. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Alex Wilhelm is editor-in-chief at Mattermark and at Alex on Twitter if you have tips about Yahoo or, uh, or Netflix or anything. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, pleasure. See you. 
After the break, everything you need to know if you plan to Pokemon and go with your kids. But first, let's take a minute to thank Igloo, the sponsor of this episode. Work is no longer a location. Teams can be together half a world away. Igloo is a modern intranet designed to keep everyone on the same page. You can share files, have conversations in real time, and do it all while still using the apps you're comfortable with like Google Drive and Skype. Igloo brings everything together and creates a single destination that lets you focus on what's important, your work. It's a cloud platform that helps you share files, collaborate on documents, blog updates, coordinate calendars, and manage projects. Anyone can add content based on their permissions with drag and drop widgets and a WYSIWYG editor. Unlike other solutions, you can customize Igloo to fit your needs and work with your current IT investments like Office 365, Salesforce, SharePoint, Active Directory, your favorite file sharing solutions, or support systems like Zendex. Put simply, Igloo is an intranet you'll actually like. Try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. When you sign up through our link, you can get your own Igloo for up to 10 people absolutely free for as long as you want. Just go to igloosoftware.com slash T-W-I-T. So Georgia, you and I both went Pokemon hunting with our kids this weekend. I can't wait to hear about your experience. In case you're not going to play the game with your children, you might want to talk to them before they head out. Joining us for some tips is Russell Hawley from Android Central, Central and VR Heads. Welcome, Russell. Thanks. So you wrote a piece about Pokemon and kids. Uh, what advice do you have for parents? I, the, the biggest thing is to use the app to your advantage. You know, if you're not going to go out with your children, then uh, the app re records a lot of information about where it is your children have been and what it is they've been doing, and more importantly, when they've been doing it. Uh, so you can kind of keep an eye on, on, you know, their safety, making sure that they're not out at 3 o'clock in the morning playing the game if you don't want them to, and uh, making sure they're not in locations that you would prefer them not to be when they're playing. So Georgia, how so I guess you I, though I guess you could say that at least if they're out at three o'clock in the morning and they're playing Pokemon Go, it could be worse things that they're doing. <laughs> oh, absolutely! Yeah, in no way is this uh, you know is this a, is this a downside for for either uh, either party, uh, you know? And, and it's a, it's a tough thing to say. Hey, parents, you know, do these things. These are really just there are a couple of tools that are baked right into the app uh, that that make it uh, pretty easy to to see what it is that's going on if you are uh, you know uncertain and you want to take a look. So there's also, you know, you also say, yes, there are all these tools where, you know, you can, if you're uncertain, but there's a lot of things that you can just simply tell your children before they go out. What, what are some of those things? I think the biggest thing right now is to uh, not not go out alone, especially at night, but uh, but really just in general not to go out alone. And it's a lot more fun when you're playing uh, with uh, with friends anyway. Uh, the the other thing to to keep in mind is that you know there there is no built-in chat system and that was intentional. Niantic did that on purpose uh, because there's such a wide range of uh, of ages playing this game. Uh, so if they're you know, if your child's using a you know a, a third-party service to to chat, make sure that you're aware that they're using it and and kind of keep an eye on who it is that they're talking to. So Georgia, um, you know, as Russell says, there's no third-party chat system, but there is a lot of uh, impetus I think to actually talk to strangers in real life, yeah. which, which is a, perhaps a little dangerous. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, and I'm writing a top 10 tips for parents. I'm just actually stolen Russell's article, and then I'm just writing it for iMore right now. It'll be out tomorrow. Um, I'm joking. I didn't actually steal your I'm entire positive article. that yours is going to be better anyway. So. <laughs> um, and so one of the things is that kids really can be lured. You know, like, so if there's like, you know, oh my goodness, there's like, you know, this, there's a dragonette or there's a like, you know, Pikachu, come over here, kids, come with me. That's a serious issue because kids are so excited to do it and people are very, very friendly. And if you were looking to pinch a child, this would be a way that could happen. So you need to have a talk with your kids. With my kids, I have a really nifty trick. They're attached to my data, so they can only travel 30 feet about away from me without losing connection. And so my kids are always with an eyesight, and they're always calling me over. They're not going to travel anywhere without me because they're not catching anything without my data and without my signal. But you want to make sure that you talk to your kids about how they can have fun. It's a lovely experience. People are all out there. You go to a Pokemon stop that's dropping different Pokemon, and you'll see people gather, but you also want to know that this does make it that kids, you can very easily see, because there's such a high level of addiction rate with this type of a game, that they would be really, really excited to do something and may not be thinking about how this could also be dangerous, because people that want to take kids are going to be 
very, very friendly and offer them something that they want. What about addiction? I mean, this is a game that has no end, right? I mean, it doesn't, you know, you just keep catching them and forever. And there's, you know, there's an element of buying things in it. Uh, Georgia, what do you think about that? So I played the game with my kids the other day and I realized right away that my kids and and myself, I don't know Russell and, and I don't know Megan, if you, I have a lot of fun playing this game and I can see how this would be something that can be very addictive. The reason that this game is so addictive is that it does not have uh, a reinforcement that's always on or always off. It's an on and off type of reinforcement. So the similar addiction levels to gambling, which means that, you know, you press the button once, you may get a Pokemon, you look again, you don't. And so you want to keep on searching because there could be a Pikachu around the corner. So I'm going to keep on looking and I want to deal with that. If you take a look at the brain when someone is playing with an off and on reward system, it is going wildfire and it is at the same rates as someone that's dealing with cocaine or a high level addiction with casino runs, uh, casino games. And so because of that, you really do want to monitor how long your kids are playing this game for. One of the things that you can tell if your kids are playing too much would be one, track their time. Two would be, are they becoming really aggressive, really upset or really withdrawn if they're not playing that game? That means that they're getting a lowering of dopamine. So when you're playing something that you get an addiction to, you feel great. You're getting a whole bunch of dopamine. Dopamine is that motivation, happiness neurotransmitter in your brain, which is like brain candy. But then when you stop playing it, you get a drop of dopamine because you've already used that all up. And so you feel sad. You might be a little bit more upset. You might be irritable. You might not be eating. If that's happening with your child, then this may become at the level where you're saying, you know what, we have to curb their level of play or stop them altogether. So, Russell, I know you've been playing with your kids uh, for a while. Um, what are some positive things that you've seen playing with them? And have, have you seen any drawbacks? I mean, the, the most positive thing, uh, you know, just right off the bat is how much time we've been outside in the last uh, week, you know, alone. It's just <laughs> been so much more time, uh, you know, walking around. And, and you know, this is, this is something my kids would rather do than be out on their trampoline. It's something they would rather, you know, do than, than just about anything as soon as, you know, we're outside. Uh, you know, if if I'm driving, they ask if they can hold my phone so that they can, you know, keep the the scanner open while I'm driving and play in the back seat. Uh, if if we stop somewhere, they want to know if there are uh, you know pokey stops that they can take a look at while it is that you know we're off doing things. It's uh it, it's really just kind of been an add on to our to our day to day lives uh, in in a really positive way. And some of that is has been communicating with you know new people as well. You know, not necessarily to a point of exchanging names or. Uh, or walking off or anything, but just, you know, really positive conversations with other people, regardless of what team they're on in, in a lot of the very public places that we've been in to see so many people also playing the game. I, I know with with my kids, it's just, to me, the, it's been great, yes, like going outside, having something to do together that we enjoy. Um, but there's, there is just the impulse control that, that when it comes down to it, like I'm not completely convinced I mean, because it's an age thing. I mean, your brain doesn't work like an adult's brain. Like you, I am, I'm, I can tell my child, like, do not cross the street in front of a car. Um, but, you know, if they're really into, uh, they're, they're, you know, catching the Pokemon, then they might anyway. Like that is, do you think that's a valid fear? I think it's, it's, uh, it's hard to put a blanket label on that. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with, you know, the environment that the child is in to begin with. Uh, my kids... Uh, have have always been really good about you know paying attention before they do things like cross the street, uh, you know it's something that's that is just you know a constant reinforcement for them and so they they you know almost always do it on their own regardless of whether there's a, a distraction around, uh, but it, it's a problem for adults you know not not just uh, not just kids uh, when when playing this game to to not want to look away from the screen even though the the game kind of encourages it with the the battery saver mode, uh, but uh, it, it's it's really kind of fascinating to see how many different responses there are. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that I could give an answer that would apply to even most children. Right. I know you said that they want to uh, they want to play Pokemon Go and, and instead of doing anything else but including like I know you guys have a lot of VR headsets. Uh does does that uh, is Pokemon Go more appealing than the VR that you guys have at home? For right now, yeah, and a lot of that has to do with uh you know the the newness of it, I think. I'm I'm not sure how they will feel about that, you know, in in 2 weeks. Um, and it's it's weird that my kids are used to multiple virtual reality headsets in a house. I'm definitely aware of that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's there's a really active component to it. You know, there's there's a there's a constant 
I guess, reward system where you're, you're going out and you're finding new things and you're, you're building up a character and each one of them have their own individual characters now, you know, so it's a, it's a, uh, you know, really kind of personal thing for them. Whereas playing in the, uh, most of my VR games, uh, when, when they do have the opportunity to play, uh, is, is usually, you know, five or 10 minutes, uh, of, of a single activity and then they move on to another activity here in the house. It's, I try not to let them play them for particularly long. So I guess they get more out of Pokemon Go, which may be why they prefer it. <laughs> yeah, time limits are important. Georgia, what do you think about the backlash against not only the game, but the people playing it? I mean, there's a lot. I mean, we see it a lot in the mainstream media. Uh, we were talking before the show. It reminds me of how people feel about drones. They feel, you know, people are in their personal space. They're not just angry about the game, but angry about the people playing the game. What do you make of that? Here's a good, you tweeted I, this sign, that you're, uh, which is pretty amusing. This uh, is this was the version of Pokemon, get off of my lawn. <laughs> I think that anything that's really popular, that has a huge group of people that are doing it, it creates a little bit of an us and a them. We, we weren't outside. You didn't see anyone outside. I think that this has brought a lot of people that were um, techier, geekier, that we usually spend a lot of time inside of our homes outside and we're interacting with each other, which is lovely. But because of that, there's all these people congregating. And so for some people, when they live close to a Pokestop, there are, you know, suddenly all of these people, teenagers, and they are not involved with that. And so one is it creates this storm of, you know what, I don't understand this and anything that I don't understand must be bad. And two, yes, if I saw a really rare Pokemon and it was right on the other side of like someone's, I can see myself stepping on their lawn to go get it. And so I can see that this would happen and really frustrate people that care about their own personal space. But anything that's wildly popular will end up having a backlash and people will end up hating it and hating the people that get involved in it. So it does create this us and them. And so when you're with it, the people that are there, we create gather at a Pokestop and it's like, I think it's adorably cute. We see all these people coming out from the woodworks when someone set a lure to a Pokestop and then suddenly there's 20 people congregated walking around, chatting, saying, oh my gosh, you know, I found this creature over here. Come over here, take a look. And it's adorably fun, but I can see that people that are not involved in this, they feel like, you know, I don't understand this. This must be bad. And, you know, people are going into police stations searching for Pokemons. They're having to stop people from churches because most of the stops are churches and other, you know, con places where people congregate. And that could be upsetting to that because, you know, the people that are running the church, they might be happy that people are going back to church. Maybe this would be a good thing. Um, but I think that it also causes that backlash of we don't understand this and we don't like to see all these people gathered in groups at all hours of the night. There's people in parks. Um, they're the security levels and the policemen um, and the security p patrols are out there. Now, if they're playing Pokemon Go, then they're happy, which a lot of them are. <laughs> but if they're not, this is a lot of business of people calling. And so it does create a little bit of a nuisance because it keeps our police officers and security patrols very busy with shooing people away from areas that they shouldn't be late at night. Well, Russell, what do you think about privacy? Is there is there an issue there for kids in, in the, the app? I think that uh, you're going to run into the, the same privacy issues that you run into with, uh, with any other online game. You know, it depends on... Uh, you know, the username that you choose, uh, one of the, the tips that I give in the article is to not let your child use their, you know, proper first name and last name for, for an avatar name. Uh, just because if we do eventually get to a point where those those names are, are shared with other users uh, in the game, then, then you know, that, that creates uh, kind of a, a dangerous vector for, for people who would want to do something not particularly nice. Uh, but really the, the, you know, the privacy level kind of ends there you know it's 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 there's not a whole lot in the way of personal information that can be given through the app itself it would have to be given either either personally or uh, uh, or through some kind of mass exploit in which case children are just as vulnerable as adults well Russell thank you so much for joining us Russell Holly is a writer and editor at Android Central and VR heads you can uh, read his article we'll put a link to that in our show notes uh, he's also at Russell Holly on Twitter thanks for coming on thanks for having me TNT's fan of the day is Terry Addington, who says, I've been waiting two months to tweet this, hashtag how I watch TNT, and hashtag my new kitchen, uh, then a megaphone emoji, a high five emoji, a woman raising hands in the air emoji. Uh, That's a nice kitchen, and I'm wondering if, Terry, you could do mine next. 
Show us how and you then watch. Mine. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of your setup or yourself. Post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, Facebook. Use the hashtag How I Watch TNT, and we are going to find it. After the break, Netflix stock might be in the toilet, but they still have plans to live long and prosper. We will explain after the break. But first, let's take a minute to thank Trunk Club, the sponsor of this episode. Summer is here. It's time to spruce up your wardrobe with summer essentials like short sleeve button downs, lightweight blazers, and swimwear. Whether you're looking for beach, formal attire, or grown-up graphic tees, Trunk Club is a shopping game changer for men and for women. With Trunk Club, you'll never have to step foot inside a store for your clothing needs again. Plus, you get your very own personal stylist free. Just type in your measurements and share your style and spending preferences to connect with the right Trunk Club stylist. He or she will contact you via phone, email, or messenger to understand your unique look and learn more about what you're looking for. Your stylist will select items for your trunk from over 80 top brands and will send a preview of clothes that may be a good fit. Before I left for my vacation, I had a chat with Carolyn. She's my personal stylist. She sent a trunk full of cover-ups, hats, even a beach bag that converted into a beach towel. It was amazing. With Trunk Club, you can review your trunk via email and make edits before it's shipped. You'll have 10 days to try on the clothes, keep what you like, and send back the rest. Trunk Club is not a subscription service, and shipping is always free both ways. Premium clothes, expert advice, no work, thanks to your very own personal stylist at Trunk Club. Trunk Club is backed by Nordstrom, which means they have the highest standards and quality and customer service. And if you live in Dallas, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, or D.C., you can stop by one of the Trunk Club clubhouses to work with your stylist in person for free. Make a statement at the next big event on your calendar with a look that's handpicked just for you and your style. Get started today at trunkclub.com slash TNT. Look and feel your best with clothes that fit you perfectly. That's trunkclub.com slash TNT and we thank Trunk Club for their support. Some good news for Netflix today and for Star Trek fans who are also cord cutters. Star Trek, the TV show, will premiere on Netflix in 188 countries, excluding the U.S. and Canada. That's excluding. But we will get to watch it within 24 hours of its premiere on CBS. According to a press release on the Netflix site, the new Star Trek show will be in production in Toronto in September for a January 2017 premiere. Netflix has also acquired rights to all Star Trek episodes. If you're not a fan yet, you can be. Is this good news for you, Georgia? Well, it's not because <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have CBS. So and do you not have Netflix I'm either? I do have Netflix, but, you know, I'm excluded. So I have to wait. I'm, But only you know. 24 hours. I know. I don't like to wait 24 <laughs> hours. I like to get it right away when the buzz is. Because the problem with waiting 24 hours is that I have to stay away from Twitter and the internet because I'm worried that I'm going to get some sort of a spoiler. So there's certain things I have to watch immediately. Now, I'm assuming that there's not going to be any great spoilers that are going to happen at the beginning that I have to really worry about, like I do with Game of Thrones. But I like to get it right away so I don't have to worry about my Twitter feed. How about you, Megan? Uh, I'm excited about it. Um, I, I wait for everything. I don't watch anything live um, ever. I mean, Nothing? even this, I have HBO Go, but I don't watch Game of Thrones. Uh, how, do you, how do you do that? You don't watch Game of Thrones at all or you don't watch Game of Thrones right away? I don't watch it at all. <gasps> oh, Ma Megan. I know. Too gory? Uh, it's a too. It's a little bit too gory. Yeah, I. Uh, okay. I, did, I, did, I understand yeah, that. Right. I don't have to watch it. You told me earlier in the show that I don't have to watch. <laughs> I don't want to watch. That should be one of the exceptions. <laughs> I do watch Silicon Valley, but I started that late, um, and I just finished this the, the uh, second season. So maybe when it comes on again, I will watch it live with everyone else. But I, I'm just. I've gotten so used to not watching anything live that I'm. I'm fine with it. Right. You know, you right. can so use. So you'll be watching it the day after, two days after. Do you like to watch it and you binge watch and you wait till there's many episodes? Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a binge watcher. It's true. Yeah, so I do like that. Uh, yeah, another interesting fact about um, Star Trek, they, they're they not Netflix. The whole franchise is not Netflix excuse, exclusive because I also read in USA Today that Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, is an, playing an alien in the new Star Trek movie, which opens July 22nd. So I think that's interesting that Netflix and Amazon... Um, both have a, they both are, I guess it's not that surprising that they're both Star Trek fans at all. <laughs> Many people are. <laughs> Many people are. And who wouldn't want to be an alien? That's that sounds true. great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he kind of. have this yeah. great role. Even, even the, the first original series, they had some really huge actors that would play roles upon in the series just to be a part of it. 
True. Uh, well, you are working on an article about Pokemon Go, and uh, as we talked earlier, you had some. You you have your kids playing um, Swift Playground on the the beta. Uh, do you recommend that for kids? And what age do you recommend it for? So my kids are seven and eleven, and they love it. They are really enjoying it. So I think that kids, I think that there are some areas of frustration that will have to be worked out because this is right now in beta form. Because um, so if your children have never coded before, you may want to first start off with them so they understand what they're doing and they understand how to restart. But besides that, I think that kids even as young as like seven and older would feel really comfortable with it. Usually it's marketed to 12 and above. But I think that younger kids will have a lot of fun with doing it. I think that Bite the Little Character is really cute and animated and it's fun to help them go through the paces to reward them with the gems and to move on to the next level. So if you're thinking about, and even for adults, if you're thinking about coding yourself, this is a really cute, fun way to go to it. So I'm trying it out myself so that I can, because I'd like to learn a little bit of how to code and understand what that might be. And it's a lot of fun. It's better. It's less frustrating. It's a nice way to get involved in it. And as you go along, you learn different formats of what is a function and how do you debug something and how does that work? So I think that it's good for young and for old. And you haven't had any problems on the iPads with the beta? Not as of yet. I think that there was a couple of times that it would freeze up and so we would restart it, but then it would start out and everything was fine. And you are still working on your anxiety videos, I assume. Can you I, tell people about I, those? Yes, we're still working with, so this is a at-home treatment. If you don't feel like going in to see a therapist or if you're seeing a therapist and would like to have a refresher that you can look over, we have a set of anxiety videos that we're dealing with and we're making a new set of videos, not only for treating anxiety and sleep, um, and we have one on parenting, but next we're going to be dealing with depression and dealing with boundaries and how you can handle boundaries and consequences as well. And so those are the ones that are coming up. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Georgia. Georgia is at iMore. She is on Twitter at Georgia underscore Dow. Um, and on this network as often as we can reel her in to come on. So thank you so much for coming <laughs> thank on. Thank you. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye. Tomorrow's guest will be Lauren Hawkinson from the Nothing Matters podcast. TNT recorders live, ev records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv or leaving us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. Leave us your voicemails. We love to hear your voices. You can also hit us up on Twitter at Tech News Today TV and find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. And you can find me on Twitter at Megan Maroney. And thanks to our technical director, Brian, and all the folks who help us produce this show every single day. And thanks to you for talking tech with us. We will see you tomorrow.